Here's Samantha Butler with the news. Legislators will shortly begin their second day of debate of the government's political reforms. More than 40 lawmakers have yet to speak, so it looks likely it could take until tomorrow before a vote is taken. But that looks set to go against the government, with opposition among pan-Democrat lawmakers showing no signs of weakening. Speaking to RTHK this morning, Executive Councillor Fanny Law expressed her regret that the proposals look set to fail. It is most regrettable and it's heart-wrenching to have to come to this present stage because we spent so much time over the last 20 months to try to debate and put reasons into the debate. But I think there were some misjudgments along the way and we really must sit down and mend the fences after the whole saga is over. We must find a way forward and we must address some of the very deep-rooted problems in our society. For example, the world disparity, the housing problem, the economic development. A series of bombs have ripped through Shia mosques and offices in the Yemeni capital Sana'a, killing more than 30 people. The blast targeted Shia worshippers at their evening prayers and offices belonging to the Houthi rebel movement. This man witnessed the devastation. <laughs> Suddenly we heard the explosion. I went outside my little shop and I saw the children on the ground bleeding. Some had eye injuries, others had leg injuries, and some had shrapnel wounds on their faces and on their heads. The explosion was terrifying. Islamic State militants said the attacks were in revenge against the Houthis who've taken over the capital and much of Yemen. The government in exile and the rebels are currently attending peace talks in Geneva. The two most senior defense officials in the United States say there's no way the U.S. will achieve its recruiting target of soldiers in Iraq. The U.S. Defense Secretary Ash Carter and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff General Martin Dempsey called for greater commitment from the Iraqi government. From Washington, here's the BBC's Ali McBall. It was a bleak picture on Iraq that was painted by America's two most senior defence figures. Ashton Carter, the Defence Secretary, and General Martin Dempsey, Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, acknowledged there was now no chance the US would achieve its goal of training 24,000 Iraqi troops by the autumn, saying only 7,000 had been recruited to date. America had also been too slow, they admitted, in arming Iraqi security forces in their fight against Islamic State militants. The Federal Reserve says the American economy is growing moderately after a winter slowdown and is likely strong enough to support an interest rate increase by the end of the year. The U.S. Central Bank said the economy is now on track to grow between 1.8% and 2% this year after contracting in the first quarter. You're listening to the news on RTHK. Good morning. Welcome back to Chat. I'm Hugh Chivert and your co-host today is uh, Ada Wong. Ada, good morning to you. Good morning, Hugh. The LegCo debate on how to choose our next chief executive started at lunchtime yesterday and all seems to be going pretty much as expected. The chief secretary and others lamented the possibility of a lost opportunity for Hong Kong. The pan-Democrats stood firm against what they see as a trap. We have pro-establishment lawmakers lecturing Democrats on democracy. We have Democrats denying five million people the chance to vote for a candidate. What do you make of the role of public opinion in all this? Do you agree with Starry Lee that the Occupy movement is at the heart of the problem? And what do you think of the uh, security arrangements? Is there a touch of overkill? Uh, email us with your thoughts, your answers to these questions. Our address is backchat at rthk.hk. That's backchat at rthk.hk. You can go to our Facebook page, which is backchat on rthk radio 3, and comment there. Or you can call us on 233-88266. 233-88266 is our number after 9.20. We're talking about work-life balance. Joining us for our first discussion, we have with us in our central studio Kevin Yam, who's a member of the Progressive Lawyers Group, Lawrence Ma, who's a member of the Silent Majority for Hong Kong, chairman of the China Australia Legal Exchange Fund, and Joseph Lee, who's a legislator, represents the Health Services Functional Constituency. Other legislators and academics will be joining us in the course of the programme uh, as well. Uh, Kevin Yam, maybe we'll start with you. Good uh, morning. Uh, was that you I saw on the front page of the International New York Times? I guess so, yeah, I think so, yeah. All oh, right, I guess so, yeah. <laughs> Explain what you were doing. I think there was a picture of your demonstration yesterday. Yeah, we were 
at the Lechko protest area, uh, we marched around the perimeters of Lechko and handed over to 22 pan-democratic legislators uh, over 7,000 letters that we've co collected from citizens expressing their opposition to the government's political reform package and asking the government to take all responsibility for the current political debacle. What was the, uh, what was the reaction like um, outside Lechko yesterday? The mood in the morning was febrile, but overall still calm. I, th I mean, I, I do see the stories coming out from media outlets that later in the afternoon there were scuffles, but certainly when we were there in the morning there were no such things. I mean, it was noisy, but it was nothing other than that. What do you make of the polls? What do you make of public opinion? I mean, you're trying to change people's minds about this issue. Why does that matter? I think for, for us as... 12 professional groups, I mean, one thing that I've always emphasised from the very beginning is that uh, as a society, we are probably a little bit too poll driven and that we're, I mean, at least for the 12 groups, we're certainly operating on principles. I mean, it wouldn't have mattered whether the public opinion polls say 90% in support of the package or 90% against the political reform package. Either way, we would still have come out to do what we were doing. So uh, for us, it's a matter of principle, really. But the polls uh, would affect the, um, um, the pan-democrats, for example. Well, I mean, that's a matter. Their decision. For, that's a matter for them. Uh, I mean, they're the ones in the political process. I mean, all we can do is to engage with citizens, as we have done over a five-week period, all around Hong Kong with street stands and the like, explaining our views and exchanging views with citizens. Uh, we can hand up the views of citizens that we've collected one by one slowly. Uh, to the legislators, but the rest is really up to them. Uh, we try and be a moral voice of conscience. Uh, the rest it's, is beyond our control, really. OK, Lawrence Ma is also with us, a member of the uh, silent majority for Hong Kong. Uh, good morning to you, Mr Ma, uh, a, a yes, group that morning. I guess is uh, opposed in many ways to, to the, uh, the stance of the progressive lawyers group, of Kevin, Kevin Yam's group. Um, what, what about the role of public opinion from, from your point of view? Do you agree with, with Mr Yam that uh, this is a matter of principle and even if the uh, public opinion was uh, wildly against, say, your stance, you'd still, you'd still keep it because it would be the right one? Sorry, I, I, I would have thought that uh, the, if you're talking about the Pope um, conducted by the Zionist majority, which was released it the day before, um, there was 60... 60% for the... Package. Yeah, I think, I mean, Kevin Yam's point is that that doesn't matter. I mean, or it doesn't matter to the extent that, that you know, it, it's either right or wrong uh, on a matter of principle. Oh, yeah, well, well Kevin's entitled to his opinion, yeah, sure. Mm. sure. And, and do you share that opinion? Uh, well, I mean, if you talk about law, then... Um, I would, dis I would disagree um, that it wouldn't be... It's not uh, a, a genuine election, if you want me to to go to that, um, I would have thought that I would uh, press against the basic law that any, any election that's uh, in compliance with the provisions of the basic law uh, would be a genuine election. Well, do you, we see that the society is very divided um, mm. at this moment. Um, what would happen after today, do you think? Well, I don't think it will pass. I don't think the motion will carry... I think it will, the, the, the package will be voted down, uh, the, the way it goes. And after that? Uh, well, I, I would have thought that um, there would be less reason for a stronger protest. <laughs> uh, people uh, would be celebrating, as I know, um, if, if, they, if the package is, is voted down. They would, be, they would be staging a party and celebration outside Legislative Council and instead of a, a, a serious uh, demonstration and charging towards buildings. Uh, I think that probably would be lesser. And how will you feel if it's voted down? Well, how would I feel? Yeah. Um, personally, I would have thought that democracy in Hong Kong hasn't been taken a step forward. Okay. Uh, do, you, do you think, it's, do you think it's, things will be as they were then, or do you think we'll actually take a step back, perhaps? 
Well, I think well, uh, the the package wouldn't be reopened until some what seven years or eight years later, if if that if it is ever open again. Um, I don't think it will be dealt with in the coming term of government, which is after 2017. I don't think it will be that that term of government will deal with political reform. It will be the term thereafter. OK, also with us is Joseph Lee, legislator represents the Health Services Functional Constituency. And Mr Lee, good morning to you. Good morning. All right, thank you very much. Isn't the danger that it's not just the status quo, it's not about where we started from, but it's, it's in a worse situation because we, we, we've ruined relationships with Beijing. Um, we're going to have a, an even more confrontational relationship between the legislature uh, and the executive. Um, it's it's going to be more trouble, basically. Well, I guess, well, uh, let me take the, this issue more positively. Well, I, I guess, well, today is the finale. After we veto this proposal and then everything should be start from the very beginning, uh, I said, uh, well, uh, I say, well, uh, whether it's the communication between the Beijing official, Hong Kong official, and the pan-democrat pan people will be a, a brand new start. But let, let's take this way, instead of worrying about what, what is happening in the worst case scenario. And, um, you know, how important uh, were the polls uh, to you, Joseph, and also the uh, views of your constituents? Well, I guess uh, my view of uh, from our constituency is also representing what the will from the Hong Kong people is basically half and half. Well, uh, let me let me uh, quantify it in a very crude manner. That means, well, there is uh, not exactly 48.3% that kind of stuff. But as you can see, for the past 24 month, uh, 24 months, well, people in Hong Kong's view about this uh, political reform proposal is uh, half and half. Uh, as you can see, it is uh, uh, quite interesting. So, uh, in, in, in my political constituency, as they are also part of citizen in Hong Kong, so I, I see uh, no difference. Okay. Then, do you see the division of the society as a result of the Occupy movement or other things? Well, uh, no, no, no. It, it is interesting <coughs> because, because I think it's the CE strategies just try to put forward the conflicts and polarization between Hong Kong people. And obviously, as you can see, in the past few months, you have to uh, uh, stand up and then uh, present it, you stand clearly, otherwise you're in trouble. That kind of notion has been wearing in Hong Kong for the past more than years. It will do, doing no good to people in Hong Kong. What I can see is after the finale today, people in Hong Kong just sit down calmly and reflect. Then together and see how the way to go forward and not keep on uh, 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 well, uh, accusing each other and doing all those conflicts and, and, and that would be doing no good. Uh, that would be nice, but of course you can't start again, can you? You can't pretend that it never happened, that Occupy never happened, that the August 31st uh, decision w- was never made. It's impossible. Well, well we, are not, we are not trying to forget the history, but we're trying to learn from the history. So after the Occupy movement, whatever, well, what, 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 what uh, are we going to go about with it? Are we going to still, well, uh, uh, don't communicate with any kind of official, just saying the, all the ideal situation? We just solve the problem. I don't think so. So it's now people in Hong Kong sit down calmly and do a rational and pragmatic manner to see how we can solve the current problem. OK, uh, Sin Jun Kai is also with us, legislator with the Democratic Party. Mr Sin, good morning to you. Yes. Uh, what what do you make of the of, of the latest polls? The um, and what role do you think public opinion has made, for example, in your decision in the Democratic Party? I think opinion polls are important, but uh, I think at the end of the day, I think uh, we have to look at uh, whether this is uh, you know uh, 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 a a a a, a, a election uh, up to an uh, international standard in which. Uh, uh, we believe uh, and okay. a reasonable uh, uh, hurdle uh, shouldn't be uh, installed in the nomination process. So I, I, I do believe that um, you know everybody in the process, including myself uh, or our fellow colleagues, uh, uh, do bear uh, do bear responsibilities uh, of uh, you know uh, failing to get a, a political package acceptable to the people of Hong Kong. Um, how, how would you mend relationships uh, between um, the central government uh, and the pan-democrats and, and Hong Kong, for example? I think uh, the relationship has never been good. Uh, and, uh, and over the uh, 
over the process, it, has, it hasn't been uh, uh, improved or on contrary, I I doubt if it has already it has, it has further burden. Um, if you, if you, uh, it's not only the relationship with the political parties, it's the relationship with the general, with Hong Kong, the trust on Beijing uh, has dropped it, uh, you know, to a, uh, to a new role since uh, the peak. Uh, in 2007 and 2008. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, Beijing has to reveal uh, their policies towards Hong Kong, why their trust uh, uh, by the people of Hong Kong has dropped uh, tremendously over the last uh, couple of years. And, uh, and since the occupying movement, uh, I think uh, the relationship uh, with, the, with the younger generations has actually further deteriorated. And I think the future dialogues between the people of Hong Kong and uh, and Beijing uh, will will render more uh, difficulties because uh, you know um, the mutual trust has uh, dropped it to a uh, record low. Okay, if you want to restore mutual trust, surely you've got it's got movement has got to come from both I, sides. I, 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 I do urge uh, during my speech last yesterday, you know. Um, uh, Hong Kong, you know, uh, not only Hong Kong, uh, Beijing and Hong Kong and people of Hong Kong should all go to the center rather than <coughs> to go, go to the, you know, the two extremes. And I think we should move to the centers uh, politically and uh, keep talking and keep uh, further dialogues. Uh, you know, we've, uh, we have free, we, you know, we have free political reforms. The first one, Beijing put forward a package, uh, you know, take it or reject it. And the pandemocrat uh, uh, rejected, rejected the package. The second time, uh, after a uh, tough uh, negotiations, uh, Beijing accepted, uh, Beijing accepted uh, our our proposed Democratic Party's proposals and amended and amended their political package uh, in the final days, and uh, and the package was carried uh, in 2010. And at this time, the, Be- the Beijing, you know, he he planned that he might have planned to uh, swing a couple of votes uh, as uh, you know as they planned in 2005. But, you know, both times, uh, in 2005 and this time, you know, by swinging votes, uh, won't succeed, uh, and all failed uh, both times. So Beijing should, Beijing should uh, you know, uh, deeply review their policy. I think, you know, we need to negotiate a package acceptable not only to Beijing, but also to the people of Hong Kong. Mr. You know, Mr. After, after, the, after the, this, this the current exercise, you know, the outstanding issue is... The Article 45 have not been implemented, and Beijing own the duties. Okay, but uh, we can all see that the Democratic Party wants to move to the centre, and you did that um, in the last round of political reform, but this time, um, you know, there's uh, no way you could move to the centre, so it's easier said than done, right? Well, Democratic Party, actually, you know, uh, we did have a proposal, political proposal, which is according to basic law, Article 45, you know, with, with the nominating committee, but their political hurdle, Beijing, you know, installed it is just simply too high. And I do believe that uh, Beijing should actually review their policy. You know, by having such a, you know, hotline approach to what Hong Kong, there's no way out. Uh, Kevin Yam, doesn't it come down to a question of, of getting the best deal that you can? Do you honestly think that you can get a better deal from Beijing? Well, I mean, the thing is, uh, people always say if you go soft and so on, you might get a better deal and so on. But I think there are two counter examples of that. One is still very current and one from history. Uh, I think it's fair to say, for example, that Macau has always been very compliant in every single way, but there is no evidence that in that environment going soft has uh, led to a better deal for the people of Macau when it comes to the political settlement. And secondly, I mean, uh, both of you and, and Mr. Sin also just talked about the 2010 compromise. Now, one thing that's been forgotten, I think, in, in a lot of the deba- debates about the 2010 compromise was that it was accepted by at least uh, many elements of the pan-democratic side on the basis that there would be further improvements and further liberalisation of the election of LegCo in 2016. Now, 
those promises have failed to materialise. Well, I thought the deal was really on the super seats, wasn't it? Yeah, but the, the super seats deal was only accepted on the basis that uh, Beijing was promising, although nothing on paper, that there would be continuing improvements. In 2016, there would be further liberalisation of functional constituencies and the like. Well, all of that has have not come to pass, and in fact, they've stood a very hard line in saying that nothing's going to change on LegCo in 2016. And it's not just that. I mean, there were previous promises about universal suffrage coming to Hong Kong in 2007, 2008, and so on. So every single time when Hong Kongers have accepted a compromise uh, on the back of uh, assurances from Beijing, they have not only failed to come to pass, but the line has been drawn even harder. So it's, it's really more, uh, very much a matter of once bitten, twice shy, isn't it? Um, Kevin, um, People's Daily's uh, editorial has been um, talking about the dear consequences uh, after the government's uh, political reform plans uh, veto today, for example, that the good environment for economic development would therefore be destroyed. Are you worried about that? No, not at all. I think that's, uh, with respect, that's just all guff. I mean, there, there's a lot of fundamental institutional and economic advantages that Hong Kong has uh, that uh, remain very important both to Hong Kong itself and to China. Look, I'm not saying that China isn't growing and that China isn't becoming increasingly important to the Hong Kong economy, but I think let's keep it in perspective. Uh, the, uh, if the, the package is voted down, we have the system that's been in existence. I mean, are we saying that the system that's been in existence has absolutely ruined Hong Kong's economy? I'm not sure that that's, that's right. So uh, let's not talk Armageddon here. I mean, there, there's still public policy issues to be dealt with. There's still business to be done. At least in my sector, I still see plenty of law firms from overseas seeking to open in Hong Kong whenever they want to set up an overseas office. It sounds like you're saying it doesn't really matter whether we have (laughs) democracy or not. Well, no, not true, because there are lots of societal issues that cannot be resolved without democracy. Uh, I mean, and, and that's, you know, no doubt, you know, there, there are other forums where we can discuss these sorts of things in more detail. But what I'm saying is that... What you're uh, saying is there talk- are these rather nebulous societal problems. Um, no, but, I mean, but, things but business like, goes they're, on they're and not, that's fine. Basically, not we can fine. work. That's fine. But, you, you, can, you can keep your job and... But uh, not true. I mean, what my point, I, th- I think that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is to say that Armageddon is going to happen. That's not going to happen. But obviously, a lot of the problems like income inequality, like the fact that property tycoons control Hong Kong, like the fact that the commercial sector dominates everything, like the fact that labor rights are falling behind the rest of the world, all of those things are a byproduct of a lack of democracy in Hong Kong. Uh, as well as governance issues, you know, we've got a problem here where uh, the chief executive doesn't have a democratic mandate. And in fact, they wouldn't have a de- democratic mandate, even if this package was passed because of the way the nomination system works. And certain LegCo members do have a, a democratic mandate, and but they don't have any power to exercise. So there are all these imbalances that can only be fixed by having genuine democracy in Hong Kong. All I'm saying is, if this package is vetoed, it's not Armageddon, but I'm not saying that the road ahead isn't difficult. Mm. Lawrence Mark, um, I mean, maybe, you know, a, a deal could have been reached if Beijing had just been a little bit more flexible. It's them that's been, yeah, that's been, that's been I, sticking. Yeah, can I, can I reply to that point? Um, I, I tend to agree that, it, because we've we got to look at... Um, the administration, the Beijing administration, the Central People's Go- Government's administration. Uh, Xin Chong Kai just said that in 2007 uh, there was something passed. There was a tough negotiation and the, the political reform was passed in 2007, which was true, but because that was during the Hu Jintao administration. But now, central government has changed. We can't see Beijing as Beijing as an unchanged body. So nowadays, is, is Xi Jinping's administration and he has, he is a tough liner. He adopts a very stern, a stern attitude towards corruption. 
and, and um, reform within the party. So I would have thought that because of that change of government, um, the, the hard lie has arisen. And it is not to compromise. And, and that, that non-compromising attitude is specifically more severe after the Occupying Central Movement. All right, Sinjin Kai? Well, I think, uh, uh, as I said, I, uh, if Beijing adopted such approach, I think uh, that is not a good way to Hong Kong, for Hong Kong. And uh, I, I do believe that, uh, you know, um, we, all parties should move to the central. The point, I guess, is that Xi Jinping is the boss, and it doesn't get you very far arguing with well, the boss or confronting the boss. You've got to be a bit, a little well, bit more subtle about the, it. The only thing that I have is a vote, a veto power. So I exercise uh, the power uh, vested on us. And, uh, you know, if Beijing really want to honour what they promised to Hong Kong, they should do it. Um, a lot of people are saying the pro-establishment, uh, of course, uh, that in 2016 the voters will punish the pan-democrats. Sin Chung Kai, well, do you believe well, that? Well, I think, uh, we, I think, I think uh, we, th- we do uh, understand that uh, due to the such realities, uh, be it, if uh, people uh, for they figure it this way. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think uh, I believe that uh, all political parties in Hong Kong, uh, we understand uh, the consequences. And we'll bear with the such consequences if they, if uh, if the situation comes. Well, but it is uh, critical that the pan Democrats retain the one third. Uh, if, um, well, if the uh, numbers if, don't reach one third, then um, then what's the point of of all well, this? No, I think that is the referendum, you know, for people of Hong Kong. If people, you know, want us uh, to be continue as the position, they will vote us in. If people doesn't want us to remain uh, sufficient enough, they were as well as uh, suggested by the CE. So let the people decide. Joseph Lee, what, what do you make of uh, what Lawrence Ma was talking about, that Xi Jinping, things are different under Xi Jinping. We've got, we've got to live with that. <phone rings> no. Uh, Joseph Lee? Wait, hello? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I guess after the binary, I think things went can go parallel. Obviously, obviously, because we do have a lot of societal issues we have to solve. But yet... The political reform is still have to going on, but I, I think whether people in Hong Kong, whether uh, the Hong Kong government, uh, even the, the, the legislators, will not only will not only should not only focus on resolving a uh, political reform issue, but also go in parallel to resolve these societal issues. Okay, and, and, and but how do you do that best? Well, I, I guess it, it, it depends on how people take the line to go ahead. Obviously, well, if people still well. Uh, I'm not saying that people should not talk about anything about political reform, but still, we have to go things in parallel. Well, that, that is a reality. But could we actually yes. calmly talk about all the other social issues and um, well, things that are lagging have, behind have, after this? That, that needs discussion lobby and, and, and how, the, uh, how our attempt that democratic camp as real, and that needs discussion. Well, it, it, as you can see in the past um, few months, Obviously, our camp people are, are well, I, 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 I see the uh, FAR government do not wish to talk anything about uh, 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 the actual issue with the pan democratic people. Uh, and so we have to sit there and then uh, talk with each other that, that then, and start negotiation and communication is important to start with. Joseph, have you been lobbied fiercely in the last few days? <laughs> no, well... Uh, uh, disappointingly, there's a lot of saying about middleman, about uh, uh, how Beijing official contact uh, my colleagues. But unfortunately, apart from the CS and the Secretary of Food and Health, well, nothing to, uh, no, nobody called to me at all. Uh, do you believe that people have been offering hundreds of millions of dollars? Well, this is a very sensitive issue. As you can see, the ICC is now uh, intervening all the issues. But I, I, I guess uh, anything can happen. Uh, but but it up to, it's up to the individual who are going to accept the offer or going to reject the offer based on his or her own principles.
OK, well, we're going to continue the discussion in three minutes' time after the news. At nine o'clock, we'd like to hear your thoughts as well. Later, we're also going to be talking about work-life balance um, in Hong Kong. This is on the back of a survey showing that uh, uh, it seems to be tilted much more to work in Hong Kong, uh, surprise, surprise, than just about anywhere else in the world. Why is that? And uh, what can we do about it? The weather forecast for today, mainly fine and very hot, apart from some isolated showers. The maximum temperature today, about 33 degrees, with moderate southwesterly winds. The outlook is going to stay hot tomorrow, and more showers expected over the weekend and early next week. The very hot weather warning now in place. The reading's 29 Celsius, humidity 77%. Welcome back. This is Bank Chat with Ada Wong and me, Hugh Tiverton, continuing our discussion now about Legico's vote on political reform as the uh, debate continues. The legislators taking their 15 minutes to uh, give their views uh, for and against the motion. Uh, we have with us uh, Kevin Yam, who's a member of the Progressive Lawyers Group, Lawrence Ma, member of the Silent Majority for Hong Kong, chairman of the China Australia Legal Exchange Foundation. We're also joined now by Chun Kim Wah, assistant professor in the Department of Applied Social Sciences at the Polytechnic University. Uh, Email address is backchat at rthk.hk. Our Facebook page is called Backchat on RTHK Radio 3. You can comment there or you can call us directly 233 88266. Later we're going to be talking about work life balance and uh, why it seems out of kilter uh, in Hong Kong. Some comment from listeners. Uh, first of all, uh, from our Facebook page, Henry and Denny, as usual, the stalwarts. Uh, and as usual, they have different kinds of ideas. Uh, Henry says, it is an opportunity lost, plus taxpayers' money wasted should the veto occur. To say it's a trap is a demonising tactic and illogical. China, in its present world status, has no motivation to do so. Rather, it wants to show its sincerity and righteousness to the world that it is increasingly democratic, enforcing its law and even setting up international rules, like, a, like the uh, AIIB rules. As CY reports to the Central People's Government and SAR for Beijing to set up a trap for SAR would only destroy the relationship between the two. Thus to say it's a trap could not stand. If I were a pan-democrat legislator, I would vote for, not abstain. There is no damage to me since it's clear that the majority of people want LegCo to pass the package, i.e. the people's mandate is there. I would be condemned by the pan-democrats, but then so what, since I could defect to the pro-establishment camp, but at least is not associated with radicals, rough behaviour, and the Occupy Central movement, which hurt everyone uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, that's, uh, that's what uh, Henry has to say. Uh, uh, Chung Kim Wah, good morning to you. Morning. Uh, thanks for, for joining us. Do you, do, you, do you agree with Henry that um, this, is a, this is a genuine attempt at, at uh, liberalisation, at further democratisation uh, by China, and, and therefore it's something that we should, uh, we should take advantage of? I, I don't think so, because uh, if you look into the proposal, uh, it seems that uh, it's quite obvious that uh, there are quite a lot of hurdles and making it uh, un- uh, really impossible for... The, the point would be that there are fewer hurdles than there are now. It seems, <laughs> it seems to be more democratic, and that China is offering us something and we're saying no. Uh, I, I don't think so, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, the, the election committee, selection committee is going... The nomination committee is going to have a very strong voice, and... And well, it will be a strong influence by officials in Beijing. It, it has, yeah, th- then it will have a strong voice, but now it's the only voice. Yes, yeah, the only voice, maybe. <coughs> uh, uh, may, may make it impossible for for any uh, local democratic people to come come up to the, to to the final final phase uh, to stand for election by the public. So uh, it is not not that uh, open. But if you, if you ask me whether this is a, a step forward, I would say that uh, maybe we we we, we would take. take uh, we, we would uh, consider whether we are going to take something uh, instead of just staying, staying still. Uh, of course, I think uh, legislators are now being uh, by by public opinion also because uh, it's not just what we think about that. Because uh, more than according to our to our voting pro, still more than one third of overall population are are not willing to take that package. So <coughs> I think uh, this is uh, the. The, the voting result will, will be quite um, uh, obvious that uh, all those members in the pan Democrat camp is going to vote down their proposal. Is, is it likely, uh, under the present leadership, under Xi Jinping, that Beijing will offer us anything more generous? I don't know, but, but I, I think uh, uh, if, if the, uh, the Beijing government should consider uh, if the political reform in Hong Kong is standing still, uh, quite a lot of local problems could be solved, and even some policy reform, 
some developmental issue. Uh, even though the government said that they are going to focus on political, uh, not, no, no longer for focus on political issue, but to step up to 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 focus on economic and and public uh, policy issue. But uh, those issues are binding <coughs> binding together with political reform. So uh, if those uh, legislators are not cooperative, if the CE is not uh, able to get proper support, if the government is not legitimized by the process of the democracy, uh, I don't think the government is going to have a very effective uh, management of society. Mm-hmm. And those reform and those uh, economic and social issues just could be uh, properly solved. Um- Chung Kim Wah, the polls, you mentioned that uh, one third um, of the people would still like to veto the package, but um, in the age group of um, below 30, uh, the view is pretty clear. Is that right from beginning to end? Yes, uh, from beginning to end, we have uh, quite, quite stable. More than more than 60% of youngsters are against uh, the package. And on the peak, uh, more than 77%, uh, on, on, on a particular point of time, more than 77% of uh, youngsters within the age group of 18 to 29 uh, would like to veto the package. And so, it's uh, the reverse uh, for people about uh, 50 or 55, right? And, uh, yeah, it's quite reverse. So uh, some people said that this is a generational conflict. I think uh, more or less this is uh, the, the real issue. Uh, younger generation. Uh, so I think that even if if the package is passed by Glasgow, uh, the problems just could not be solved because uh, if if uh, the younger generation who is going to take up the leadership in the next phase of our society development, uh, if they are strongly against that kind of democracy, uh, that the system will not be good enough to pacify them and to make them uh, um, uh, agree with what the government is going to do in the next decade. OK, comment on our Facebook page from Denny, who says, if I were a legislative councillor, I would absolutely vote no on the reform package. It's absolutely a trap avoided. Yes, the package allows registered voters in Hong Kong to vote, but we all need to consider what this voting right is based on. The vote is based on the fact that the candidates will be screened by a nominating committee whose very legitimacy is questioned. I'm not optimistic that any subsequent reform will happen after it passes. The legitimacy, legitimately elected CE under the proposal may be questionable too, as this unaccountable nominating committee will sift out any candidates not favourable to Beijing. Another problem is that some rules are made out of emotional sentiments that aren't legally uh, objective. What does it mean to be not resisting the Communist Party, as C.H. Tung has said? That's the disqualification of being the chief executive. Who gets to decide that? Does James Tin say, saying that C.Y. Long should consider resigning during the Occupy movement con- uh, constitute resisting Beijing? Uh, asks Denny. Thank you very much, Need for, for for those comments. Uh, Lawrence Ma, you you were saying earlier, Xi Jinping is you know is is a, is a hardliner uh, in this, more hardline perhaps than than uh, previous uh, leaders of the of the, the, the Central People's Government. Um, but isn't the lesson that the hardline doesn't pay, doesn't work? The tougher that Beijing gets with Hong Kong, the more Hong Kong kicks back, and the worse the situation gets. Well, I guess it, it, it does in reality, but I mean, what what. What China, what what mainland is concerned, is Hong Kong being a stable political, politically stable city, um, and they they do verily believe there would be um, international forces of various forms of trying to use Hong Kong as a base to affect or try to change China's legal system, or to even further. Um, uh, dismantle the um, political party in, in, in the mainland. So it is their concern that they're more concerned about the political stability in Hong, in Hong Kong. OK, an email f- addressed to you for us is from Tom, a listener, who says, Please ask Mr. Ma, as he said that China is not going to compromise under President Xi with his absolutely no compromising attitudes with regards to many issues, uh, especially Mr. Ma quoted Xi's anti-corruption stance. Could Mr. Ma, as an expert on Chinese law and Western common law, comment on the closed-door trial and subsequently extremely light sentencing verdict on the ex-security Mr. Zhou's case, as compared to hundreds of death penalty verdicts for similar cases with much lesser charges in China? No compromise please don't make me laugh uh says tom uh lawrence Ma, tom's suggesting that there that there are certainly compromises sometimes uh, I, I can't comment on that because uh, 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 what mr joe child I, I don't understand what joe child is referring to but um they, he's, t- he's he has taken a tough stand on, on anti-corruption that's true um i can't point to you any specific example of his compromise as such um so if, if Joe can, if the, if the person who writes the email can point to specific examples of compromise. 
Well, I think I think the, the specific example is uh, the example of uh, is it Joe Ron Kang, uh, uh, Joe Yong Kang, the um, uh, head, former head oh, of, right. of security, uh, who was tried um, in secret and uh, received a. a um, yeah, yeah. A, a life sentence, a life sentence uh, but, but not but death penalty. Not death penalty. Yeah. Well, if, well, I mean, I, I, I don't see giving him a life, life sentence as a compromise. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I can't see that. But other people in the similar situation have received the death penalty. Um, true, but I mean, he has probably he has, he has come forth and, and repatriate so um, significantly. That's what I heard, but I, I can't comment further on that. Okay. This is a comment from Bowen, uh, an email. Thank you very much indeed, Bowen. Bowen says, When the reform package has been vetoed, it will have been a small opportunity missed and a great many traps avoided. A small opportunity missed because if the passage, uh, if the package had been passed instead, indications are that the election would turn out to be as much of and possibly more of a fiasco and farce as the 2012 election, and pan-democratics would have, been, would have been able to make a lot of political capital out of it. The number of traps avoided are so numerous they don't need to be mentioned. Unexpected bonuses so far far are the eye-opening hypocrisies of members of the establishment. For example, while Dr. Chung Ting Yu has always de- been derided by the establishment, his opinion poll recently was quoted with approval by none other than the chief executive himself when it showed the numbers in support of passing the package exceeded those in opposition. Another such instance was a perennial insistence by members of the establishment that foreign forces are working with the pan-democrats to derail governance here until both the British and American government started to urge the pan-democrats to accept the reform package. Uh, Lao Tzu Kui quoted that possibility, apparently with relish, in a radio programme a couple of weeks ago, and basically said that they, it would be so good he would not totally believe it himself. So it turns out that even Dr Chung can be a patriot, and the American and British governments can be friendly instead of hostile foreign forces uh, when they see eye to eye with the authorities, uh, says Bowen. Thank you very much indeed uh, for those comments. Our email address once again, backchat at rthk. Dot HK on our Facebook page is Backchat on RTHK uh, Radio 3. Um, what, well, let's go, uh, Laura, uh, Kevin Yan, what do you make of the, uh, the attitude of, the, of the, um, uh, the Chinese government? And Henry's going back to, to Henry's point that uh, uh, China has no motivation to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, get a trick. Uh, it is trying to become increasingly democratic. It's trying to uh, live up to um, international standards in many respects, like the, like the AIIB Bank. Well, I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is uh, we can speculate or we like about motive or otherwise, but we look at the facts as they are, and the facts as they are is that the package that we've been presented with in Hong Kong is uh, not up to international standards, and worse still, uh, I mean, I know some people say it's a step forward. I would argue it's actually a step backwards because you are actually forcing uh, millions of Hong Kongers to become uh, to become bit players in a show that's been concocted by the nomination committee. I mean, basically, uh, it's the nomination committee chewing up the food and, and spitting out the leftovers for uh, Hong Kongers to deal with. Now, on, and then on the question of uh, things like political stability and foreign forces and so on that Mr. Ma had mentioned, uh, on political stability, what is clear is that uh, the present system doesn't work. What is clear is that if this package was passed, uh, given some of the figures that have been cited by uh, Mr. Chung just now, uh, uh, in fact, that would not be a recipe for political stability because uh, the chief executive's mandate would be questioned even more. The, uh, the, the best way to achieve political stability in Hong Kong is to have genuine democracy in Hong Kong. Uh, and the best way to ensure that Hong Kongers wouldn't rock the boat when it comes to uh, the Chinese system of governance is to let Hong Kongers have genuine democracy. And then on the question of foreign forces, uh, as w- one of your listeners have said quite correctly, uh, if, if we look at who is uh, in bed with foreign forces, it's certainly not those who are seeking genuine democracy in Hong Kong. It's, uh, in, instead, it's those who are in power because all the major uh, Western consulates in Hong Kong have, have had their consulate generals going around lobbying democratic lawmakers uh, to, in support of the political reform package, and simple as that, really. Are you worried that this is all leading us basically in the wrong direction? We just get little 
pre echoes of it. We've had this. I mean, this, the 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 bomb plot, whatever the substance of that is. We get the booing of the national anthem. You're just getting these little tastes of a, of a growing hostility, growing tensions uh, in Hong Kong. These are not good things. Well, I mean, the road ahead is. Definitely not going to be an easy road. There's It's no downhill, road basically, isn't it? Well, not necessarily. I mean, uh, we uh, time will tell. But the fact of the and and no one can tell what the future holds. But what we can say, it, it's is, not good. No, this, uh, this this growing distance, especially among young people, that does not bode well. Well, I mean. <laughs> Uh, but let's look at w where the responsibility lies for that. Uh, if we look, say, even back in 2003 when 500,000 people uh, marched against Article 23, I mean, I was at the march at the time, uh, the fact of the matter is at the time all the discontent was directed at the Hong Kong government and any attempt to yell slogans against the central government at the time was shouted down by most protesters and everyone trusted the central government. Uh, what we've got to ask is what's happened in the years since then that has caused public sentiment to change to such an extent. And if we have people who, if we had a populace who have pretty well trusted the central government, even as they were marching in huge numbers against the Hong Kong government uh, as recently as 12 years ago, then uh, I think it's pretty clear where the responsibility lies uh, for this deterioration in the situation as you describe it. But then, Kevin, nevertheless, um, you know, there are a lot of young people who are now very radical and... Um, Uh, a bit out of control. But, but, but I, I, I disagree with that. I mean, uh, what we see is that whenever people make noise in society, you call them radical. Uh, yes, there are, it seems like there are people who are making, you know, more vociferous uh, uh, noises than others. Uh, there are the odd, there may well be, we don't know what the facts are yet, there may or may not be the odd nut jobs around, but on the whole... Uh, 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 Hong Kong people are, are, are rational, sensible people. Even the young people are very rational and sensible. I mean, you look at the umbrella movement, if we're going to call that radical. Not a car was burnt, not a shop was looted. Uh, n nothing of that sort happened. I mean, it's as rational as it got. In fact, some, you know, uh, I've, I've had some Western friends who've complained that Uh, uh, maybe uh, our youth are, are, you know, a bit too tame. So I think when, whenever we talk about people being radical and out of control, I'll give you one example of radical and out of control. Yesterday when I stood in front of a bunch of pro-establishment protesters, there was a, a, a number of pro-establishment protesters who were faking this, the, the, the sign of a, a machine gun trying to mow me down. Now, is that violent or not? I think let's look at where the violent attitude lies. Okay, Kevin Yam, thank you very much indeed for joining us. One more email. Uh, this is from Tom. Uh, it's also reflecting on the discussion yesterday. Tom says, very interesting to hear Mr. Peter Wong's views and opinions on your program yesterday. Can someone please explain to him the principles of ICCPR Part 2, Article 3, or better still, the Hong Kong Bill of Rights, Ordinance Section 8, Article 21, when he's next on your program? Hope you and Michael Chigani were just being kind rather than being fearful of upsetting the not so right, not honourable, and non elected NPC member yesterday. An individual who spoke like he did in the public current affairs news programs in the Western countries would not last more than a couple of minutes when being interviewed by journalists like Jeremy Paxman in the UK and Laurie Oakes in Australia before being made painfully aware of his ignorance and ill-conceived statements, no matter what political office he holds. I uh, don't mean to be harsh, but unlike CCTVB and ACCTV, I am extremely grateful for RTHK being the only terrestrial broadcaster still producing fair, unbiased and high-quality political and news programmes, as well as engaging with public discussions about sensitive political issues during these turbulent times, despite being under enormous pressure. Thank you, Hugh, and to your colleagues. Please keep up the great work of stopping all of us from turning into the rhinoceros in Eugene Ionesco's play, uh, says Tom, with a, with a sort of a mixed blessing there.
there. <laughs> thank you in the, in the comments from Tom. Thank you very much indeed for that. And thank you to uh, all those who emailed and commented this morning. And thank you to uh, our guest, to uh, Chun Kim Wah from the Polytechnic University, Lawrence Ma, a member of the Silent Majority for Hong Kong, and Kevin Yam, a member of the Progressive Lawyers Group. Thank you. And uh, also the legislators who are joining us this morning, Joseph Lee and uh, Sin Jun Kai. I think we'll be tackling the same issue once again uh, tomorrow. Maybe the vote will be this evening or possibly um, tomorrow morning. Uh, and then maybe we can turn to something else, like, for example, work-life balance, which is what we want to do in the uh, final part of the uh, programme today. An interesting survey um, published this week on uh, people's attitude towards work and expectations of work uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, researchers from the recruitment agency uh, Randstad uh, spoke to a number of people, found that uh, in Hong Kong, 77% of them felt that they had to take work-related calls and respond to emails, uh, even when they were on holiday. That's uh, higher than China, India, Singapore, Japan, Australia uh, or New Zealand. Um, also, f- a, a recent survey also found that uh, 23% of the working population put in uh, 51.5 hours a week uh, or more. Um, the uh, director of Randstad said that poor work-life balance meant companies could have trouble hiring staff and convincing them to stay. A survey uh, last year as well found that 84% of people in Hong Kong worked longer hours than stated in their contract. For comment, we're joined now by Fern Nye, the Chief Executive of Community Business. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thank you very much indeed for, for joining us today. Thank uh, you. Do, do you agree with those, with those conclusions that uh, taking a call on holiday is a sign of uh, something being, out, being wrong with the work-life balance? Well, I think the findings um, from the survey are pretty consistent to our research over the years. So we've been looking at the topic of work-life balance uh, for nine years now. Um, and um, we find, uh, you know, just looking at technology and emails and um, the work environments uh, that, that people um, are subject to these days, if you're working in a global organization, there's going to be emails coming 24 by 7. And it's really important for employers and employees to have good communication about expectations. Do employers really expect their employees to be answering, re- reading those emails and answering and responding over the weekend and holidays? And um, employees, they should also um, articulate to their, their, their bosses their own needs and desires and expectations around work-life balance. So, Fern, you're saying that this is happening globally, but in fact, Hong Kong people actually work harder, you know, more hours per week than others. Is that, is that you know, what shows in your survey as well? Well, we, we don't actually track the number of hours, but we do track people's attitudes to work-life balance. And one of the questions that we've been tracking all along is to what degree employees feel that they are achieving their ideal work-life balance. And that's been consistent at about um, six for the last nine years. So clearly employees are not happy. Um, they're not satisfied with their work-life balance. And in terms of some of the key findings of the survey, um, 70% of employees see work-life balance as a critical factor affecting productivity, engagement, attraction, and retention of talent. Um, health and family are very important aspects of people's lives that get affected by poor work-life balance. And a really large number of employees would consider leaving their jobs for better work-life balance. Is this better or worse in smaller companies? Um, you know, I think, um, you know, it, it varies. I think there's more of a recognition and, and I think a growing recognition that work-life balance is an important issue. Um, I think multinationals, uh, companies that we tend to work with, there is a recognition about the issue. Um, I think, you know, we hear a lot you know, from local employers saying, you know, work-life balance, if we embrace it, aren't we reducing productivity and it would add to cost. So they tend to not focus on the benefits of work-life balance. For example, more engaged employees, higher productivity and lower turnover. Um, you know, I think, you know, going back to, you know, the situation in Hong Kong and we've been tracking Hong Kong. We have not been looking at other countries, but within Hong Kong, you have, um, you know, Hong Kong has been successful and prosperous because of its can-do spirit and hard work ethic. However, um, employers should not abuse this unique spirit and culture by expecting their employers to work hard all the time, because that would lead to high stress, burnout, health problems, and family issues. Employers should really um, focus on their employees being productive and 
efficient through working smarter on being engaged and to respect their employees as individuals that have lives who have lives outside of work. Do you think um, this has something to do with um, Chinese culture as well? Um, Chinese people are hardworking, very detail oriented, very efficient, and and so they're just very responsible people, and they just have to work over the weekend as well. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think um, Chinese do tend to have a hard work ethic, and it starts from you know how you know how they were how they are growing up and in school and so on. But if you look at, um, you know, uh, Gen Y, Gen X, for example, Gen Z, the millennials, they've got different attitudes toward, towards work-life balance. So one of the questions that we asked last year was about um, whether um, employees would leave their jobs in pursuit of better, better work-life balance. And we found that Gen Z, 43% of Gen Z, 36% Gen Ys are more willing to quit their jobs um, than Gen X at 27% and baby boomers at 18%. So you see mm-hmm. quite a difference in generations. And, you know, if you look at five years from now, Gen Y and Z will dominate workplaces. Yep. So employers really do need to have strategies around this. Okay. So what are the things that uh, employees can do to make um, the young generation happy? Um, I think uh, a, a lot of um, employers are looking at flexible working arrangements, some sort of flexible working time, um, and, and that doesn't mean cutting short your working hours. It could be, mean that you have core working hours and some employees come in earlier, some might come in later. Um, some employees Doesn't that just make things worse, though? Isn't there the danger then that you get a sort of bleed between, your, between the work and your life? Uh, and that it's you know it's 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 easier in many ways to have a sharp dividing line that you leave the office and that's it and you come home and and you have your working hours and then you have your your, your home, but I hope flexibility life. is actually uh, quite favoured by the younger generation. Some some people don't want to wake up early, for example. Yeah, absolutely, <laughs> everyone is an individual and they have their own needs and you know different people have like, are different. Um, in parts of their career, and so they may have um, changing needs throughout their career as well. You know, I think work and life does tend to get integrated and blend, um, and it's you know it's a very personal um, issue. You know, what I view as my ideal work-life balance will be very different from what you you see, and it depends on the nature of your your job and your work. You know, yep. some some jobs you can work at home quite easily. I, I, I know uh, a big international law firm. They allow them um, uh, some of their lawyers um, to uh, pick up their kids, for example, and they can leave the office early on the understanding that they reply their emails in the evenings. So I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Then you get the flexibility. Then you can take care of your family issues, or you can uh, take your grandmother to hospital, and you won't be um, penalized for doing so. Oh, absolutely. Um, one of the findings from our survey two years ago was that work-life balance was a key issue for people who are caregivers um, that have um, maybe elderly parents, or they're looking after siblings or relatives. Not necessary. And and this is something that employers may not be aware of. You know, of course, employers would be aware of, you know, if you're a working parent. But if you're, if you're not a working parent and, and you, you have, are in a, a caregiving situation, that affects you as well. Mm. Well, Fernand, thank you very much indeed for, for joining us. Fernand, Chief Executive of uh, Community Business. Thank you very much indeed. One more comment uh, from uh, uh, email. This is from Drake. Uh, who says uh, on political reform, of course, it's, of course, the problem of the non-compromising people. Look at this. And he has a quote from Xinhua Daily from 1945, the right track of democracy. For a democratic country, the power stroke sovereignty should be in the hands of the people. That's intrinsically right. If a country calls itself democratic, but the power stroke sovereignty is not in the hands of the people, this is absolutely not the right track, as it can be counted as metamorphosis, not a democratic country. What is power sovereignty by the people? According to Sonia Send civil right ideology is the right to elect and recall the government and the right to create and revoke political systems and laws. It's only when the people truly exercise these four rights that a country has the fundamental conditions to democratise. That's from uh, Xinhua Daily. Drake, thank you very much indeed uh, for that comment and thank you very much indeed to uh, all our guests uh, this morning and uh, to you, Ada. Uh, here's the weather forecast before we go. It's going to be mainly fine and uh, hot today apart from some isolated showers. 
Temperatures up to about 33 degrees. The very hot weather warning is now in place. Now, look, it's going to stay hot tomorrow. More showers forecast over the weekend and also early next week. At the moment, the air temperature is at 30 Celsius and the relative humidity now stands at 80%. To prevent Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, avoid contact with affected persons, wildlife or birds while travelling. Always keep good personal and environmental hygiene. And clean your hands before touching your eyes, nose and mouth. If you develop symptoms such as fever or cough, put on a surgical...